things are the way that they are for a reason. You can not agree with the reason, but the mistake is thinking that somebody made a bunch of mistakes to get to a place where 10% of the kids are, you know, reading on grade level. Hey, I'm Rick Hess, uh, Director of Education Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Terrific to have you with us. I got the privilege of having with me today my friend and colleague, Darrell Bradford. Darrell's Vice President of 50CAN, uh, Honcho of NYCAN, New York CAN. Um, and we're here to talk a little bit about what you've learned in the world of education advocacy and trying to, trying to fight for things that you think will make a difference for kids. Sure. Thanks for having me. Hey, my pleasure. So let's start with this. How'd you get into this stuff? How, how does one wind up becoming an educational advocate? What's that even look like? I think there's, it's, there's a lot more uh, paths to get into it that are pretty directed now. I mean, you could be Teach for America, you could do Ed Pioneers, I mean, it's like you could do Lee. There are lots of different ways to, to end up in a job that helps you work in a district or in a network or something like that. Um, when I did it, it was like I was out of a job and I was looking for another one. Um, <laughs> I had been uh, working in New York. I was, um, I was an English major. I've been working in publishing for a while. And the magazine I was working on folded in uh, August of 2001 and then 9-11 happened, literally like two weeks later. And I was looking for a job for like nine months and a friend of mine from college called me up and said, hey, my dad just started this nonprofit in New Jersey. Maybe you could help him. And I was like, I'll do whatever they, they want me to do, you know? Um, and so on April 13th, I think is what it was, 2002, I got on a plane and I went to Milwaukee. And that was my, that was my intro. Um, and we toured the, the district. We looked at schools participating in the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program. We looked at uh, district response to charter competition and district authorizing. And we talked about, you know, how the public schools were getting better there and like how families are being empowered. Um, and uh, none of this should matter or could matter. Uh, like, I'm, I didn't have any kids, I still don't have any, so I was like, this is kind of cool, but I don't really get it. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I grew up in Baltimore. I had gone to uh, a private all-boys Episcopalian K-12 school on a scholarship um, from grade seven to 12. It had obviously been the most important thing that had ever happened to me. Um, and so, like, very quickly, I made this connection between, like, this was what my own life was like. We're trying to organize the world around the same principles where like you don't have to win the parent lottery, live in the right zip code, have super rich parents to go to a school that makes you free. Um, and so that was, that was kind of it. And uh, I was the communications guy. I was like writing and fighting, doing websites, sending out emails, like putting together little reports. And then I was the deputy working for um, a guy that was like a, a father to me, like a strong sort of political and communications figure. And he really mentored me a lot. And then he passed away and I took over for him. So I just kind of, moved up and uh and now here i am today like the person having drawn the shortest straw <laughs> so you, were you guys mostly fighting for school choice in new jersey at that time or yeah it's, it, it's interesting like i look at um so i was there from like 2002 to 2011 at this specific organization and we were um and this all, was e3 e3 yeah uh was, so we were all in on choice and by that we meant all of it but with an emphasis on uh, private school choice for low-income families in what in New Jersey are called the Abbott districts, um, which are basically like lot, like the poorest districts in the state, you know, the most sort of industrial, but um, because of a long series of state Supreme Court rulings, the richest. So, you know, you're spending $30,000 a kid in Asbury Park um, or like in the 20s in Newark. I mean, it's like the, I'm, I'm not saying that's, that's, that we shouldn't do that. I'm saying that it's a lot of money, you know. Um, and so that was like the core issue. But like most things, I think, the more you know, the more you know more. So in the beginning, we were just like, you know, first thing we gotta do is disrupt the system. And then you're learning about that and you're like, but yeah, this this whole thing about how teachers get hired. And like, what about tenure? I mean, like this, the incentives around this are all wrong and it's like, what about graduation standards? Like we're giving, you know, the same diploma to kids who fail the exit exam three times that we give to kids who pass it outright. Like, what does that mean? And then all of a sudden it's like, you have like a, a more um, systems view that was always anchored in giving somebody a ticket out today, but that got more sort of interesting and complicated over time, the more we understood. So how do you juggle that? So on the one hand, you're like, look, we want to make sure kids get exercise choice this year, get to a school that works for them. Mm -hmm. The other hand, you say, wait a minute, but this stuff's all tangled. There's teacher, event, like teacher systems. And it's like, is, and how big were you guys? Did you guys, how many people were at E3 doing yeah, this work? So, so when we, in the, 
in the halcyon days of, uh, of New Jersey education reform, we were really like blowing stuff up. I would say they were like, uh, all in, we were like 25 people. Um, we had an office in Newark, we had one in Camden, um, and we were sort of organized in a, in a, around a couple of different um, act areas of activity. So we had like a legal effort, we had a, a coalition that we ran that helped us lobby in Trenton. Um, we had like a sort of a robust communications campaign, and um, and we uh, and we you know we worked on Charter Choice and a bunch of other things. Um, and so, how did you juggle that? Like, so Charter right. Choice, how do you? Yeah. So, so this is complicated. So, so we're always anchored in the thing that mattered to us, um, and our signature policy was a tax credit scholarship program for low income kids. Um, at the same time, we were writing, talking about, supportive of other things that other people wanted to do. The question, there were two questions that came out of that. Back in the day, it was like, will you support vouchers or private school choice? We don't know if we want your help, right? Mm -hmm. um, even if we were the biggest, baddest dog with the most ability to create right. the, the moment for change. Um, and then the other one is that there's, there's a thing that you care about doing and the other things you want to do, and they're the, other, they're the things that everybody else will let you do or will identify you with. So, mm -hmm. like, I'd go to the, like, my guys were the first people talking about ending tenure, like, before we had, you know, Teach NJ, which was the tenure reform bill. And I mean, long, long before there was an organization set up to deal with teacher quality issues. But the legislature, legislators would be like, oh, you guys are the private school choice guys, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was tough. I mean, like, we did have, like, a more holistic view, even though we had a favored lever. Right. Um, the question is, like, whether or not other people are gonna let you pull anything right. else. Did you learn anything about, like, if, because right, I, I can easily imagine that there's folks who say, hey, we want to work with you on teacher quality, but we don't want to be in bed with somebody who's supporting school vouchers. Yeah. That's, did you, have you learned things? Did you learn things over time about how do you manage those relationships? Yeah, so there's an arrogance that's born out of the shame of it, basically, because after a while, you're kind of like, look, man, I don't need your, like, uh, uh, I don't need your blessing to support your issue. Right. Like you, you can enjoy my support without my me enjoying yours. Right. Um, and you you take that because like you you have a focus on doing what you think is right for for kids of whatever stripe or flavor that your organization is, is built around. And so like getting great teachers in the classroom um, in the absence or in the presence of a robust choice system is something we were interested in. So, you know, we kind of be there. Um, what I always hated, though, was how. And what I continue to hate is sort of how like dismissive and insensitive it can be when somebody says to you, basically, yeah, I don't like your issue, but I'll, I'll take your support. Um, because like everybody d does these things because they have a set of values that are aligned with doing them. Um, so, you know, I mean, I support lots of different types of reform, but I care a lot about private school choice because I went to private school. Like, <laughs> like, why would I deny that to somebody else? Like, that makes a ton of sense to me. Um, and because somebody else believes differently, like, I don't, I don't think they're, like, less or, you know, sort of less worthy of participating or that I should be more dismissive of what they're about or whatever. And a lot of the time, like, the private school choice people, like, you know, you're the last person who gets invited to the party, <laughs> even though you're the first person bringing the alcohol. I mean, it's just really like, it's, it's very frustrating. So, but you know, something you just said, I, I, I've heard you speak before about, right, how, you know, how, how seriously you take this work, yeah. right? How much, but you just said, look, you, you also, you can live with somebody not supporting private school choice, even though you think that this makes a ton of difference yeah. for some kids. So how do you strike that balance? How do, how do you kind of look at somebody who's opposed to something that you think is good for kids yeah. and kind of manage, manage that relationship? Yeah, so, um, so it's complicated, right? Um, I think the, uh, so one of the things I try to do first is really like get personality out of it. So people um, are in organizations that are more or less risk, of, risk averse or, uh, uh, or sort of, um, I wish I could, uh, or, or, or have more or less affinity for risk. That's what I was looking for. Um, and in every sector. So like uh, we could be talking about, you know, cell phones or whatever. You get like really groundbreaking stuff and you get, you know, really crappy stuff, you know, based on how much risk people have. Um, so, and a lot of the time people are in organizations where they agree with your fundamental premise, but you know, where they are doesn't allow them to do that. And like, I get it, you know. Um, I think what I've been most frustrated about is that we, as a as a movement or an effort, if you want to call it that, spent don't 
we don't spend a lot of time helping people understand that like even the stuff I care about isn't the only thing that needs to get done. And so we develop very few ref like reform minded people who have like broad views of what you need to do. Like, uh, like Success Academy doesn't work unless you have the mix of parent choice, ind independent, strong authorizing, um, educators like free to teach, amazing curriculum, you know, like a relentless sort of management approach that you that is sort of like from the private sector that's applied in the nonprofit profit sector. You got to mix all that stuff up to get, you know, these like oases of amazing achievement where before you had sort of like a, a desert of, uh, of low performance, like 11 years ago, even. Um, so most people approach what we do is like, well, you know, once we get the teachers right, we'll be good. You know, like once we get, you know, accountability, uh, right. accountability, right, everything's going to be fine. Um, and I just I don't uh, you know, you can't build a house with a hammer. You need a hammer, but you need saws and, and other things, too. So I don't, I don't know where that came from or, or why it's been that way. That could have something to do with like our like how our political um, stripes sort of influence the approach. And obviously, like you say in your book, how our personal experiences um, inform our approach. Um, but I would love to get more folks who are like, you know, I need every tool I can to make the world better for a kid on the corner in Newark than, you know, one tool, one tool alone in like the Lord of the Rings kind of way. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you spent, you know, a decade on the ground in New Jersey working one state, kind of a set of districts. Were there a couple of things that you, you, you really learned from that time that shaped the way you go about this stuff? Yeah. Um, so uh, the... The first thing I would just say, um, and Andy Smerick said this too, and so I'm, I'm in no way saying that I think that it's good that this happens, right? Or that we shouldn't act the way that we act, but that, um, that things are the way that they are for a reason. You can not agree with the reason, but the mistake is thinking that somebody made a bunch of mistakes to get to a place where 10% of the kids are you know, reading on grade level. You're spending two or three times the national K-12 average um, and, uh, and nobody seems to care, right? Um, uh, in, that, in that circle are lots of other interests that are, um, that are getting met, like you know, college accounts are getting paid, like houses are getting bought, you know, uh, uh, lots of adults are, are filling up savings accounts, like food is getting purchased, um, you know, and, and there is some value to the fact that schools employ people, right, as, as one thing that they, uh, that they accomplish, you know? The question is always like, when does um, a thing have too much weight in the mix if the goal is to actually educate kids, right? I, I mean, I, I think most people <laughs> should believe that the goal of these things is to make sure people actually get educated. We can even like fight over what education means, um, but I don't think we should be fighting over whether or not literacy is a good idea, you know, um, just as like a baseline. Um, so uh, I used to look at, you know, stats in Newark or in Trenton or in Camden or in Patterson or something like that. And I'd be like, I don't understand why the world isn't on fire, right? Like when you, when you know that you, you, your kid's going to go to school, they're going to go to this school, they have to. And no one that you know has been successful who has gone to this school like in your lifetime. Like you don't think something's wrong. People are like, no, no, no everything's fine. You know? um, so the, the, Would people I, really say stuff like that? So, um, you know, I think there was a sense that, or there continues to be a sense, um, it's actually two things. On the one hand, that like things are so intractably the way that they are that they must be that way. Um, you know, one, like I, I think we struggle to excite the possibilities for people when most of the stuff that we talk about is things that people can't touch. So even in America, like 90% like of Americans think when you say charter, you talk about a bus you put people on, right? They've never sent a kid to a charter school. They don't have a family member <laughs> or a friend who goes in and, like, and has had a life-changing experience. And so it's like, it's an abstraction, you know? Um, and if you saw the kids in your neighborhood one way and then another way a year later, that would, that would sort of change your horizon for what is, is possible. Um, and I don't think we've done that well. But I think it's hard to do well, uh, and there's politics and a whole bunch of other stuff that, uh, going on there. So, um, so helping people understand it could be better is is really difficult. Um, the other part of it, um, and I think I sort of see this in my in my own life. So, the 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 first time I went to like a restaurant 
with some of my friends and uh, I had like steak that was like mind numbingly good. Like when I ate it, I was like, oh my God, this is so good. Um, it sort of rejiggered every other steak I'd ever had, right? So I was kind of like, I thought this was the bomb. I was like, this was terrible. Um, and we like, folks of color, which is where I've worked, we talked about this, um, you know, the problems of education are not unique to uh, cities in, you know, heavily industrial democratic states in the Northeast. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, you live in that way for a very long time and your, um, your view on what is acceptable also changes. And so the, like the notion of, you know, and the ritual of sending your kids to the neighborhood school is, is very powerful. Um, and it can override your, your sort of um, uh, like limbic sense that something should be different or better or faster or whatever. Um, and so both of those things just require like a lot of disruption um, and it's, it's hard to do, particularly with lots of folks who, you know, again, don't have tons of great examples um, and have long rituals of sort of underperformance that masquerade as normalcy. <laughs> so, you know, the, 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 you're now with uh, 50 Can. Yeah. You're, you're right, vice president of this kind of organization that works with state affiliates mm -hmm. in a bunch of states across the land. How is that different from working in a single state? Like when you start thinking about this stuff, across a lot of states, nationally. What do you have to be aware of? What, what changes? So it's, so it's complicated. So the, even as, as a person who runs one of the states, I think about all of the stuff I knew about all the chuckleheads in Jersey. Like, this guy isn't with us because he's in bed with these people. This woman hates us because she does this. Like, I mean, the intimacy of it all. It is just really difficult to recreate that from a, a state advocate standpoint, which is part of the reason why it's so tough to switch states. I mean, like, the local context, the history is, like, really, really everything. Um, so it's just hard to keep, like, I have five states, um, all, like, all of our southern states plus Delaware. And um, it's hard to keep it all in your head. Um, it's interesting, um, so it's hard to keep it all in your head. The, the sort of benefit of it, at least for, for me, is that um, working in a state that is very blue, um, managing a bunch of states that are very red, I get like a really interesting view on the tension between like, you know, like central command and more like, you know, uh, diaphanous. Maybe that's a <laughs> word I'm looking for. I think that's it. Um, Good use of diaphanous. Thank you. I'm, try I'm trying my best here. I've been saving up all my best vocabulary that's for you. That's impressive, Um so, so, like, that whole view, I think, um, is, aw is awesome um, if, like, uh, uh, difficult to, to wrangle. Um, and it really has changed, like, my view on how I think we should approach a lot of problems. It's, like, it's a, it's a lot more hands-off. Um, and, like, the trade-offs are about... How much, how much not awesome you're willing to have to get more good of what you want, you know, versus like good versus bad, <laughs> I, th I think. Um, but the second thing is that um, uh, the, I get a sense, I think a better sense of what is being tried to actually stop us. Um, so like every state has these aspects of being canary in a coal mine. So like you look at Maryland, um, you know, where, where I'm from, and uh, everybody thought it was about charters, and then a governor's charter school bill goes down, and then the Democrats rip accountability, the whole thing. And everybody who was like, oh, no, no, charters are too much, was like, oh, man, what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm looking at that, and I'm like, this is a playbook that's going to get tried in another state you know, with similar circumstances pretty soon, or like the, um, the arguments on Massachusetts charter cap. You know, they, those are the same things being used to, to tank the OSD, the sort of achievement school district in Georgia, it was all about local control and that kind of stuff, you know, like the anti-testing, opt-out stuff going on in, you know, Nassau County and in Central Jersey, like, you know, that emerged and then New York did it and put a lot of money behind it and you'd see it happen in other states. So like the, the best and worst part of it is that you can kind of see it coming. You know, the challenge is whether or not so, you can head it off. It, it, so on that Maryland example, it, it, is part of your lesson then that the charter, the charter bill actually weakened the fight for accountability, or what's, what's the takeaway of now, what you just said? So while people were fighting over charters, they weren't trying to kill accountability, right? So like, to, to me, the, like, it's like every discussion or every negotiation. You don't go in and ask for the easiest thing. 
you go and you ask for the hard thing and you, and you walk back, right? So most of the policies that I think we call sort of mainstream now are the result of people coming in and asking for the world, right? Like uh, uh, ESA before there was ESA, like money in your hand, cash on the table, you know, like all kinds of freedom, like any, cool, any school could start up and people are like, yeah, that's a little much. How about we do charter schools, you know? Um, and so like, you know, obviously charter schools have benefited a great deal from the tension between like, you know, a more pluralistic approach to choice and a more regulated one that is a step back, you know? Um, but then the next step back from, from chartering is accountability, right? So like all of these things, they, they stack on one another. So the moment you give up a rung on the outside, the, you know, the Visigoths get closer to the, to the <laughs> castle. Uh, so I'd, I'd, again, like this is a, another reason why you, it's, I think it's helpful to have a, a broader approach about policy because not only do you need them all to actually fix a range of problems, you kind of need the tension between all of them to defend all of them. Mm. So last question. When you're working with folks who are newer to this stuff, who are trying to get their minds around it, who are trying to, you know, negotiate all these all these complicated things we're talking about, a couple pieces of advice you find yourself given kind of over and over? Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the, the number one one lately um, is uh, there's the way you think the world works and there's the way it actually works, right? <laughs> uh, so um, particularly when... Um, so we have a, 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 an advocacy campaign, of like a, a fellowship that we call You Can. So if you're like just a person who wants to make some change in your community, you're in that. And it's, it's 25 people. Um, and I teach two classes for them. Uh, one is on uh, sort of like race and lenses on race. So I do um, some stuff on Black Lives Matter some stuff I've written on my black life, which matters a great deal to me, uh, and like J.D. Vance, right? Because these are kind of two different lenses on the same problem, you know? Um, and trying to bridge those and build some sensitivity about them. And the other one is about um, uh, policy change and what, are, what we think you should do and like, you know, that social movements are inefficient. But, um, you know, they're sort of necessary, but insufficient is, is what it really, they are inefficient. Um, and that normally the way stuff gets done is at least get together and they do it. Um, like, there was nobody focus grouping people on broad market in Newark to find out if they wanted to keep their doctor when the healthcare, when healthcare was getting done. People were like, we do it healthcare, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I really just try to uh, ground people in the fact that, like, the, the world is not like a, you know, sort of mythically organized around what's right. It's, it tends to be mythically, you know, organized around um, what's doable, right? Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't fight for what's right. So, uh, so that, uh, that practical thing is there. The other thing, um, particularly with the current, like, politics that we, we really, really work on and that I really stress to people is that um, you have to figure out what matters most to you. So I'm an ad reformer first. I, ha I happen to be a very conservative Democrat, um, and uh, so I vote in Democratic primaries. But my feelings about what I do in education are informed by the fact that I am Democrat. They're not ruled by it. So, like, I care about equity because I care about, you know, fairness and the little guy and the little black guy who lives in the city, you know. Um, and uh, lots of people aren't that way. And uh, I'm not going to say whether or not, you know, they're like, the politics matter to me first. Um, I'm not going to say whether or not I think that is right or wrong. I think it is right for some people and wrong for others. Um, but I think that people have to figure out whether or not they, which one of those matters most. Because particularly at this time, I think, um, like if your politics matter for you, you should work at the RNC or the DNC. Um, if you care about improving outcomes for America's kids, like you got to kind of subordinate that. And I'd, I'd sort of offer that respectfully to people and they can figure out what they want to do with it afterwards. Mm. Real, man. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Doc. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Darrell Bradford. Thanks for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint, and be sure to check out the rest of our videos and research from AEI.